information and resources will be linked here. And then also my contact info if you have any questions. Move and thank you. Next slide. And so the current transportation improvement program or the TIP identifies 2.5 million for the livable centers set aside. About half of that is available to project sponsors during this 2024 application cycle that we're kicking off today. The funding can be used for consultant services, for planning and analysis, for the creation of the small areas plans that focus on livability and connected multimodal centers. And we'll go through that in a little more detail later on in the webinar. Um, but also last note here, the full policy for the set aside is linked on that Livable Centers page of the Dr. Cog site. This was formally adopted by the board in spring of 2023. So we can click forward two slides here. On to the next one. Yes, perfect. Um, so the Livable Centers program is rooted in Metro Vision. This is the region's plan for growth and development and also rooted in the Dr. Cog vision. The program really aims to have a nice integration of concepts of transportation and housing and land use to advance the regional goals and advance the quality of life in the Denver region. And if we go to the next slide, we'll dig more into the specific program goals. The program will fund consultant services for projects that support centers and nodes that are connected by the region's multimodal transportation system. So as you think about your own community, think about how a planning effort could help your community enhance centers that are transit, pedestrian, bicycle-friendly places, foster a diverse mix of land uses, plan for a range of housing, employment, and services, um, enhance public gathering spaces, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, support existing neighborhood. Um, that's kind of what the, the program is targeted towards. Um, I have the, the key words you'll hear me repeat throughout the webinar highlighted in purple here on the slide, really focusing on the vibrancy and the centers on the transportation system. If we click forward two slides here, um, the project types can take on a wide variety of format. So a lot of examples up here on the screen. Um, deliverables could include plans, analyses, public engagement reports, land use code guidance. It's really meant to be flexible so that project sponsors can develop a project proposal that's truly tailored um, to your planning needs and your specific local context. Um, so again, a lot of uh, robust uh, examples included here on the slide, but it's meant to be flexible to meet your needs. Uh, just two notes I want to point out here is that it's not meant to take any sort of infrastructure projects through the design or engineering phases, and also not meant to work towards environmental clearances on any projects. On the next slide, uh, so transit-oriented communities, the Bill 1313 passed during the most recent legislative session. If you're not yet familiar, I recommend reaching out to DOLA for more information. DOLA is the entity responsible for administrating and implementing the requirements of the bill. At Dr. Cog, we understand that many municipalities in our region are now working within the context of the bill's requirements. And we just wanna acknowledge that we see some alignment with projects that could be good candidates for the Livable Centers Program and planning efforts that municipalities might be taking on now in order to meet the bill's requirements. So the bill, um, as most of us are, beginning to be familiar with, the bill aims to increase housing opportunity near transit, and that is one of the many project types that could be a good candidate for this Livable Centers program. Of course, not this program is not in lieu of any technical assistance or tools that are provided by DOLA, but just to, to say that if you have a type of project that you're thinking of, um, we would welcome that proposal with this program. On the next slide, the eligible project locations. Um, the location is a really key component of these projects. Um, like we went over before, there's a really broad range of eligible program types. Livability in itself is a broad topic, but what's really important to make sure that you're developing a project proposal that fits in with the, the goals and what this funding and what the technical assistance is intended for is that this is a center or node on the multimodal transportation system. So 
really thinking about key centers and how a planning effort there can align with the pro program goals. Um, a couple things to note, this is a small area plan. So it's not meant to be a citywide or countywide or jurisdiction-wide effort, and it's not meant to study a single site. Um, but those small areas, those uh, key centers and nodes within your community is what this program is, is really targeted for. Um, second note on this slide is that due to where the funding comes from, the project location does need to be within the MPO boundary, the Metropolitan Planning Organization boundary. Aside here, um, you'll see that a lot of concepts fall under the umbrella of the term livable centers. Um, we don't mean this to be a prescriptive term. Um, livable centers are diverse types of central locations for different communities. They could be called activity centers, multimodal centers, town centers, station areas. You might call them a, a wide variety of different things within your community. Um, but there's not specific criteria to be named a uh, livable center. It's not a designation Metro vision. Um, we're really looking for any projects that align with the goals of the program on the multimodal transportation system. So if you recognize some of these terms that are already uh, in circulation and some of the conversations you're having with your community, um, then this could be a, a great um, project proposal for you all. On the next slide, the eligible participants, we welcome project submissions from all agencies listed here on the screen. We also encourage partnerships between these agencies to collaborate, bring forward a project together, or just in support of one another. One thing to note is that non-governmental organizations, if you plan to act as the project sponsor, um, should provide a letter of support from a relevant local government. And additionally, a letter of support would be necessary if a project or study involves changes or improvements to right of way or you know, parkland or, or something that's controlled by a public agency that's not the project sponsor. Essentially, we want to make sure that these plans are implementable. So if your project proposal is to study a land use change, for example, um, we would want documented support from the local government that has the authority to implement those types of changes. Um, just acknowledging they're aware this is being studied, there's buy-in and support, um, and that there's momentum that this could be um, a good plan to be implemented. Look forward to slides here. We'll go into the program logistics. So again, this is for consults and services, for planning and analysis. We have 1.25 million this cycle, and the next cycle would start solicitation in Q4 of 2025 or Q1 of 2026. On the next slide here, um, roles and expectations. Dr. Cog, we will ensure that the project is fully funded. So a local match is not required. The projects will be fully funded using federal funding and then also state toll credits thanks to a partnership with CDOT for, for providing that local match to those federal funds. So the local jurisdiction or the local project sponsor won't be asked to provide a local match for these projects. Additionally, Dr. Cog's staff will manage procurement, service project manager, handle intergovernmental agreements with CDOT, all the staff time and admin associated with uh, federal funding sometimes at Dr. Cog for this project. We will take care of all of that for you. We want to remove um, barriers, and our goal is just to get some good planning studies in the door. Um, and lastly, Dr. Cog staff will work together in close partnership with project sponsor in order to support community needs and goals. Um, we want this to be a true partnership and collaboration and see these plans move forward into implementation um, and have a lot of buy-in from the project sponsor. So all the kind of activities, roles, expectations that are listed under the project sponsor section are kind of in the spirit of that. Um, so of course, you would wanna submit a letter of interest to propose your project, um, to submit it for consideration, and then if selected, um, just participate in true partnership and collaboration. So, um, kind of commit to attending recurring meetings, share relevant data to the study, support community engagement, um, 
make sure that your local officials, your board, your council is, is kept up to date, perhaps you know, share some presentations. We want um, staff to be able to review interim deliverables and provide feedback. So um, this, again, this collaboration partnership will be essential for achieving shared goals and making that positive impact that we're wanting to make with this program um, as a way of kind of, you know, both parties heading into the project with a shared understanding of that, the project application or the letter of interest form does ask for a letter of commitment and understanding that would acknowledge that role of the project sponsor and um, just kind of share in this commitment together. So it's, we should be signed by someone in senior leadership with authority to commit staff time, but um, we don't expect that a council action or, or anything uh, more than senior level staff would be needed uh, in order to submit that letter of commitment. Okay, on the next slide, this again is how you'll get to the Dr. Cog website. And I am going to uh, share my screen here. Let's see, Sheila, if you want to turn off your screen sharing, I believe I have fixed my screen sharing to be able to share um, my web browser here. All right, I believe that is working. So, okay, great. <laughs> Sheila gave me the thumbs up. Um, so we're gonna move forward again. This is the Livable Center small area planning set aside here. Um, how I got to it was if you're at drcog.org under growth and development, you're gonna see the Livable Center's small area planning set aside. And this has all the information that I have been sharing with you today, but in much greater detail um, goes, you know, some highlights on the page, but what I'll focus your attention to here is some of the linked resources. So down here, how to submit the letter of interest. This again, it's opening today. It is open until October 7th. And this is the link where you can submit your letter of interest. So you'll see here, it's a pretty short form, um, asking information about the project, asking your contact information. Um, great news, there's unlimited characters you can put into this box. So just uh, <laughs> type away. But if you wanna be more focused in your approach, which I would also recommend, um, we have these links here that I recommend kind of opening in a separate tab while you're filling this out. So we have the evaluation criteria, I referenced this earlier on in the call. Um, this is that tip set aside policy document for the livable centers planning set aside here. Um, the evaluation criteria starts on page 64. And you'll be able to see, you know, everything very explicitly how your project proposal will be evaluated. Um, according to these categories that were approved by the board in spring of 2023, and to what extent that will uh, factor into the weighting of the overall score of the project submission. So you'll see here that these uh, titles match up with uh, the titles, these orange titles in the project application. So as you're encountering the Metro Vision section, for example, uh, reference over here, the Metro Vision section of the scoring criteria to understand better how you could get a low, medium, or high score in that area and how this question will be weighted in your overall score. The questions are intended to elicit a response from project sponsors that gives us all the information we need in order to score the project, um, but also pay it attention to some of the language in here. Again, it's it's one page, so it's not too hefty to sort through. Um, for example, in this section, you can get full points if you, uh, you know, show clear alignment with three set-aside goals, um, which are derived from Metro Vision. So if we go over here, this again is trying to elicit that exact answer from you. Um, how does your project align with three of the little Livable Center's program goals? 
which are derived from Metrovision. And it will explain down here, uh, demonstrate alignment with three program goals for maximum points on this application, projects that have excellent explanations of three of the most relevant goals will score higher than projects with a really brief explanation of all of the goals. So wanted to point that out to you. Um, but again, this is all correlated with this document. And then again, repeated here um, to try to help you out and to get your, your project uh, to score most accurately um, when it's submitted. So all this kind of muted, kind of grayer text down here will give you more context that is helpful to answer the question above. For example, this one asks about the program goals and the program goals are all, all here, right here for your context um, to choose from. There are some um, application questions that uh, ask for, for example, um, it, it could be helpful to go to the site, gis.drcog.org slash data tool to um, get more context about how your project is fitting in regionally. So again, this is this same site is linked on this Dr. Cog, the landing page for the livable centers right here with the level, level letter of interest submission and the evaluation criteria. The data tool is linked right here. It's also, uh, like I said, on the application, it's we try to add all that information right there uh, on the question, just so it's ready there for you to access without digging. Um, so you could also copy and paste that into your browser, but it will lead you here. Um, and so, for example, if I was answering this question about demographics in the project area and marginalized community, it tells me to go to the demographics layer, equity index tracks, and then click on my project area to see data that could be related to this question and how you could frame your response. So if I go into the data tool, I'm going to go to these layers. And then I'm going to go, just like the application said, over to demographics. And I'm going to look at the equity index tracks, and I'm going to click this little eyeball um, to uncover the visibility of those tracks. And I'm going to zoom into my product area, and this is totally random, but if I just click on a census tract here, then it will populate with all this information, um, how many people are living in this census tract, uh, people with low income living in the census tract, it gives you that as a kind of a raw number, and it also gives you this as a percent. Um, it includes a lot of different demographics, age, youth, older adults, limited English proficiency, um, living with a disability. Um, so I encourage you, and also the application encourages you um, to visit this data tool, dig more into your project site. This is helpful for us to understand how um, the project is impacting the surrounding community, but also, you know, helpful for us to start brainstorming more, you know, the scope of the project and how we're going to tailor everything for the unique community around it. So this is a good exercise kind of for everyone. Uh, the second question that asks, that mentions this data tool, I'll just scroll up to it. It's under um, Metrovision. No, it's under... <laughs> alignment with the program goals, and it asks how your project fits into the regional multimodal transportation system. So like I said at the beginning of the webinar, those two phrases that I'm continuing to repeat throughout this is that it, your project location is a livable center, and then it's on the regional multimodal transportation system. So again, livable center, it's a it's a, a flexible term. It's meant to be that center central location for different communities. Could be called activity centers, town centers, station areas, a host of different things. But first, this asks you kind of how your livable center fits within you know this kind of terminology. How your project area fits within that terminology, and then it asks you about how it fits into the regional multimodal transportation system. So just to kind of give you a sense of how you could frame your response on that one, this one again asks you to go to gis.drcog.org slash data tool 
to view the regional multimodal transportation system map. And it suggests these layers. So it's transportation system layers and active transportation system layers. If I go over to my data tool, I am gonna close out of my demographics by clicking this little eyeball. Now it's invisible. And if I go under active transportation, I can look at pedestrian focus areas, for example, and see how my project area might fit into the focus areas, short trip opportunity zones, um, active transportation corridors, existing, proposed. The other one that it mentions here is the transportation system. So if I go to um, the regional roadway system, I could view that. I could look at the regional rapid transit system and look at that. Um, it's again, not meant to be prescriptive, but this is kind of how you can st sort start to understand how your project area fits within the regional transportation system and be able to um, articulate that really well in your response to that question. So those are the few things that I wanted to point out as you're going through the application system. And just to summarize, you know, this is your letter of interest submission. This is the form you're filling out. This is the evaluation criteria and the Dr. Cog data tool. So you'll want to have all three of those open um, in your tabs here to reference as you're filling out that application. Sheila, if you're able to uh, continue sharing the PowerPoint from slide 17. Thank you. <laughs> So again, um, this is the last time I'll go over the evaluation criteria. We went over a few of them before. Uh, definitely recommend going straight to that PDF. That's the policy document that was adopted by the board. And that is the document that whoever is reviewing your project application will compare your project proposal to that criteria. But just to kind of summarize, um, these are the things that are listed in that one page of that PDF. Um, so marginalized communities looking at potential impact on access to opportunity, alignment with Metro Vision goals and transportation related objectives, the alignment with regional transportation plan priorities, and then lastly, project readiness, you know, kind of just a demonstrated commitment. Um, and also, how does this connect to your local context or local plans? Um, how does this, you know, fit in with the larger picture in your community? Um, and lastly, innovation and transferability. So potential for innovative practices um, and then potentially something that could be applicable to other communities within the region. So on the next slide, um, again, these are some key dates. August 14th today, the letter of interest application opened. So um, everyone's off to a good start by attending this webinar on the morning of the 14th. Um, this letter of interest submission will stay open until October 7th. Um, so that gives you a little bit of time to coordinate um, as far as project development, filling out the application, but also um, getting any letters of, of support that you might need for your application, um, partnering with any local organizations, any anyone who's doing similar work in your community, building those partnerships, collaborating on, on what types of projects would be useful. Um, so that will go until October 7th. And we intentionally made that a longer period of time to allow for all those conversations and coordination to take place. Project selection will go through November and December, and that includes approvals from the Transportation Advisory Committee here at Dr. Cog and the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. And then we're looking to do consultant procurement in February, March, 2025. This is the timeline that we're targeting. So um, through the consultant procurement, again, Dr. Cog will be kind of leading the process of making sure that we're procuring like in a, in a way that CDOT is wanting us to do and, and complying with all of that. 
But then also um, we want to make sure that we're working really closely with the project sponsors to nail down a really specific scope for the RFP um, and exactly what we're looking for. So plan on some staff time around then to, to nail everything down really well. The letter of interest process doesn't ask for an explicit detailed scope. It's not an RFP ready um, product once the letter of interest is submitted. So our work will be kind of in that um, uh, winter timeline, making sure that we have that ready for for procurements that are that'll be our kind of first step together um really exciting and leading into project kickoff around may of 2025 so that is the timeline we are targeting um and we look forward to over the next uh, many weeks seeing some of those project proposals roll in um i'll open it up to questions i'll be looking in the q a box here on the webinar to see if there's any questions in. So if you have a question that you're interested in um, and haven't typed in the chat box now, is your time. Um, we'll be opening those up now. And I'll also, um, Sheila, if you're able to scroll to the very last slide, I can put my contact information up here on the screen. If you have any questions that pop up later, always feel free to email me or or call me, I'm happy to have any sort of preliminary conversations um, if you're thinking of a project and not sure how it might fit in. And the question we have in here, are TMAs or TMOs, uh, transportation management associations or transportation management organizations, do they need a project sponsor? So no, they are eligible to be their own project sponsor um, for this program. If there is, again, if there's something that um, involves the decision-making of other public agencies, we do encourage a letter of support um, from those agencies and partnerships and conversations before the project is started. But TMAs and TMOs are eligible to be their own project sponsor under this program. All right, so we've got a, another question here. Um, I'm Andy Taylor uh, with uh, Dr. Cog. Uh, regarding recent changes to the fiscally constrained list of projects in the Regional Transportation Plan, um, the uh, uh, evaluation criteria are focused on the big investment priority categories. So it, it's not necessarily tied specifically to the project lists or, or details like that in the regional transportation plan, but really those big um, investment priorities that I believe are also listed on um, the letter of interest form as well. So uh, those are listed really early in the regional transportation plan. Uh, they include things like our um, um, uh, rapid transit corridors, but so it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to specific projects that are listed in the regional transportation plan. It looks like we have uh, one person raising their hand hand. Um, we're not able to unmute you. So if you are able to type out a question in the chat box, we would love to hear it. Um, or if it's something that is easier to talk through, um, happy to, to set up a meeting or get on the phone um, and talk through things more thoroughly.
I just want to note that so the chat box is disabled due to the large webinar format, but the Q&A box um, is open for questions and you should be able to type them in there and we'll be able to see them. Caitlin, we've got another question here from um, about um, housing needs strategies. Would you like me to try and answer that one? Oh, sure. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So the question is, would housing needs strategies align with this funding source? So I think they definitely could. Um, I think the key thing here is that um, this set aside, this uh, program is supposed to be looking at small area planning. So um, we wouldn't want to see things that are um, going, uh, covering a complete jurisdiction. Um, so if the housing needs strategies, if there is a strategy in there that is uh, related to a small area, a, a center or node um, that can be demonstrated to be along that uh, multimodal transportation system, um, that could definitely be something that, that I think could, um, you could tell a really good story about how that meets the program goals. Um, and, and MetroVision goals as well. We got a question. What is the general range and anticipated fee for these planning studies? We don't have a prescriptive answer for um, exactly, there's not like a specific cap or specific limit or a specific minimum or maximum that we're looking for in the anticipated project um, amount. Um, these are planning consultant studies. They're not like infrastructure projects. Like if you're involved ever in the TIP process at Dr. Cog with STBG funds or TA funds or CMAC funds that are funding large infrastructure projects. We don't expect um, anywhere close to those since these are um, planning consultant uh, funds. But like I said, during the presentation, we do want this to be tailored to whatever planning effort would um, be most beneficial to your local community at this time. So we you know, want you to kind of tell us, you know, what is the, the scope and what's a, um, reasonable fee that's associated with that. Um, and we can kind of go from there. Um, there is kind of a, a timeliness to when we need to expend the funds since the larger portion of this is STPG funds um, and they need to be expended in a certain timeline. So that would, you know, also limit the fee in, in some way just because we're working within a timeline. Um, but to, to answer the question of what's the range and fee that we're looking for, there's not a specific maximum or minimum. Uh, one last thing I'll add is that if there's a lot of really small projects that come in that are really you know similar in nature, um, we could kind of group those together for procurement pur purposes and for maybe just a community practice purpose. Um, if it would benefit the projects to do so, those could be grouped together for more efficiency there if they're on the smaller end. Uh, of types of things that someone's trying to accomplish with a single project could just be that you need some sort of analysis or study um, and, and requires maybe some technical pieces, but maybe there's also an engagement piece that's included. Maybe there's some plan making piece of this that needs to be done. And so I think keep that in mind as you're trying to estimate um, how much the, the fee might need to be. Also budgeting extra if there's going to be yeah, significant engagement, if there's going to be um, a role for that consultant team in helping get this over the finish line in terms of adoption, or if there's some pieces related to implementation, like drafting pieces of code or, um, or the like. So um, I think those are other thoughts that we've had as we, if we've been considering what the, the range of anticipated fees might be. It is flexible, like Caitlin said. Uh, 
question about the timeline. Um, so to answer your question there, um, letters of interest open from today until October 7th. Project selection and approval from uh, Transportation Advisory Committee, Dr. Cog Board. Um, all of that project selection process would go through November or November and December of 2024. Procurement would start in February, March of next year. And then project kickoff would be May of 2025. So that's the timeline that we're looking on now. And um, when we go to kind of scope out the the process, the projects a little more after project selection and going into procurement um, will kind of work between us and then uh, potential consultants on what type of timeline would be most appropriate for the project. We got a question of uh, where will the recording be posted? Uh, we will, we are recording this webinar we will post it to the Dr. Cog website and we can link it on that Livable Centers page that I shared earlier in the presentation. And then we'll also send an email out to everyone who's attended this webinar, confirming that you know here's where you can find it and links to the project resources. We got a question, does this technical assistance program qualify for new town funded development or is this for updating redeveloping existing uses there's an upcoming project to create a new town center and thought this may be a good opportunity to enhance that plan so um i would say for the project submissions you know think about um kind of the program goals and think about your your project location and how it aligns with those goals and you know how this area functions as a livable center in your community and how it interacts with the regional transportation system um and i would encourage you if you if you have something that you know hearing all the information on this webinar has made you think this could be a, a good project for this um we encourage those project submissions we made the letter of interest process really you know kind of short and sweet compared to some uh, of the longer grant application processes um, to kind of welcome those ideas um, and to lower the barrier of entry to just kind of submit, you know, if something would be uh, positive for your community and this is a, a planning effort, then we would want to hear that through this process. Yeah, and, and like Caitlin outlined, when looking at the letter of interest form um, and looking at those evaluation criteria, that investment in uh, existing communities um, is only one of those program goals. And um, an applicant still has a chance to, I think, maximize the the points in that area um, or the the scoring in that area, um, even without that one goal, because there are other goals to really help tell the story about your project. So I, I think there's still potentially a really good case to be made, like Caitlin said, to, to look at those other program goals. Okay, well, the questions have kind of uh, slowed down in the chat box. Um, if there's anything, anyone currently typing, please try to enter that in in the next uh, next minute or so here as we're wrapping up. Um, but I just wanna say thank you to everyone for joining the webinar today. Thank you for your interest in this program. Thank you for um, you know being invested in in your communities and enhancing livable centers on the region's multimodal transportation system. Um, we really look forward to receiving your project proposals. Um, my contact information has been put up on the screen multiple times during the webinar. So I encourage if you have any questions, please reach out. Um, and other than that, uh, have a wonderful day and thank you so much.